Today is May 3rd, 2023, and we're here at the Positive Pomona Production Studio in downtown Pomona. My name is Andrew Quinones, and I have Mrs. Elena Mafla Quinones here with me, my mother, and we're going to be, I'm going to be interviewed for a podcast, a birthday podcast. We're live here at the Positive Pomona Production Studio in downtown Pomona. It's uh, Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023, and today is my birthday. And today I have a special guest in my studio, uh, Mrs. Elena Quinones Mafla. This is my mother, and she's going to interview me for a live broadcast. So, hi. Hi. Okay, so we have named this podcast Candid with Quinones. And so we're going to go ahead and we're just going to jump right into it. We're not going to sugarcoat anything. And uh, I just want you to know a little background on your, your listeners to know a little background on Andy. Right. And, and just and again, I haven't heard any of the questions yet, so I don't know what to expect. But again, Candy with Quinones, uh, I'm going to guess we're going to be very honest uh, to the community. Yes. And tell a good story, I hope. Okay, so I really wanted to start off with 46 years ago today, because today is Andy's birthday. Uh, he was born in 1977, and that was the same year that Elvis Presley died. Oh, really? <laughs> I remember some of the big events. Yeah, and so um, let's just go right into it. Andy's mom, at the um, she gave birth to Andy at the age of 19, and a month later, she took her life. And uh, three years later, his biological father took his life. And so that is Andy's story, and um, I think years later, his biological uncle told Andy that he was the result of a one-night stand. So I want to ask you, Andy, because you're just such an amazing son, um, tell me how, you know, those are some of the adversities you grew up with, so tell me a little bit about, you know, your thought process and keeping positive, yeah. knowing some of your background. Well, I got to tell you... Um, I want to say that the first part of my life was somewhat of a mystery because I didn't have a full understanding. Now, I, I think it's as an adult now and that I have children, I could understand uh, your reasons as an adult to keep certain things away from a young child. I mean, a young child doesn't need to know how uh, his mother had passed away or his father passed away uh, at that time. But again, for the first so many years of my life, uh, I knew that my 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 parents had passed away. I knew I was with an aunt and uncle that I called mom and dad. However, uh, it, it was a constant confusion to me in the sense where, you know, every grade that I went to school, I had to explain to people why my last name is different than my family's last name. Um, s- people would ask me, even as a kid, you know, how did your mom die or how did your dad die? And I didn't know the answer. And so I had to use my imagination a lot as a kid. You know, I don't did they die in a car accident? Um, did, did something happen? Did, did, you know, my imagination would often run away with me as a small child, not having a full understanding of where I came from or how I came to be. I knew that I had love in my life uh, through you and my dad, Rodrigo. Um, however, uh, I want to say it, I, I often felt like somewhat of an outsider in the sense, and I was often question am i am i genuinely loved like 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 a a mother would love his son or a father would love his son um again sometimes i did feel the like like somewhat of an outsider uh however i did feel loved like say going to my cousin's house on the my dad's side of the family rodrigo's side the colombian side um even though i did feel like an outsider somewhat i still felt so welcome and so loved within the family um so it, it's it's two sides of a coin, you know. At one side of a coin, I felt loved and taken care of. On the other side of a coin, I felt there was a great mystery, and a, and a great em- uh, uh, something was missing. Something was missing uh, as well. Okay, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it it absolutely does. And so that kind of brings me to my next question. About four years ago, I remember going to um, a church service where a pastor. Uh, Jan was, 
And I remember you talking about forefathers, yes. and Dad and I were sitting in the audience, and <laughs> it was a really interesting topic. But can you kind of just summarize that and talk a little bit about that, uh, about your forefathers? Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, again, there was the biological father, the one that, that planted its, its, his seed uh, that gave birth me uh, in the sense where that's one father that was never present in my life. I, I've never got to meet him in person. Uh, I only was able to hear stories from him. Uh, however, uh, I, of course, later in life, my father is, is a part of me in the sense where one, like health reasons, uh, mental health or physical health. And also, I mean, again, his story is a part of my story. Uh, so the one is the biological father. Um, the second father, I think, was, I think about God. I think about, you know, I was baptized as a, a Catholic in a Catholic church. And I remember um, we called the priest father and we called God father. And God was invisible, and but he was our father. And so I, I think the second father was like the, uh, the invisible father. So I had two invisible fathers, the father that, that died early in my life that I had no connection to. And then the invisible Godfather uh, that it was invisible and I had no, con I won't say connection to, but I didn't understand. Right. Uh, we call the priest the father and then God is our father and who is my father? If he's not my father, then who is my father? So it was, it was curious about, again, God being the invisible father that's always guiding our life, but untangible. And then the third father was, again, Rodrigo Mafla, um, my uncle by by kinship, uh, your husband, and uh, so he was the third father that came into my life that that took care of me and provided for me uh, and, and guided me in my younger years. Uh, and then the fourth father that came into my life was, of course, was Danny Oaxaca. And um, at 18 years old, I got into some trouble and uh, I had a thousand hours of community service. And he was the the person I connected to to do my community service and became a mentor to me. And over the, the the next 18 years that had passed between us, he took me under his wing and treated me like a son and, and guided me through, uh, I guess, the adult phase of of, of work and in career. Because because of him, uh, because of my community service, I, I chose a, li a life of, uh, a, of continued service. I've been in nonprofit work my whole adult life. And so he was like the fourth father of my life uh, that came in after I was 18, 19 years old uh, to guide the way, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, as we think about your childhood growing up, you know, you were just a month old when your mom died. And Andy, I mean, and, and my brother and I, I was at the time 21 and my brother, I think he was 18. So we decided that we were going to raise Andy because uh, I remember my dad had found a family in Mexico that wanted to adopt you. And we said, over our dead body, we're going to do our best to raise you. And we didn't know what the heck we were doing. You know, you do the best you have with what you know. And so you kind of worked, you know, moved around from person to person. And uh, and then, you know, he Andy was in the gifted and talented program at a very young age. So we knew that he was a masterpiece in the making. And he was just really smart, but Andy's right. He got, got into his fair share of trouble by the time he was uh, in junior high, started hanging around with the wrong crowd and got mixed up with the wrong group of friends. And so tell him a little bit. Well, let me uh, let me start it off. So when Andy was a little bit older, he got in some problems with the police. And, uh, and I remember thinking, you know, as a parent, you never want to give up on your kids. And so I decided at the time to have an intervention for Andy. And I didn't even know what an intervention was, but I knew that desperate calls cause calls for diff, desperate measures. And so I decided to do an intervention, and I invited friends and family, people who loved Andy. I think there was a police officer there, and there was a friend of yours. And we decided that uh, Andy walked in, and I told him that, that he was going to be dead and that this was his eulogy and that he needed to hear what people thought about him. And so... Tell the audience a little bit of your experience with that. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I was 16 or 17 years old at the time, but I remember I was hanging out with my, my friends at the time, and uh, we were smoking some some um, cannabis and maybe even doing some little drinking. I came home 
uh, probably around six o'clock at night, and I see all these cars in my driveway, and I, and I come into the door, and the door's open for me, and I'm and and I'm thinking, oh no, not a, a, a lecture, and, and so uh, my mom, <laughs> she asked me, you know, we, we we're gonna do a little experiment, and uh, we really like you to participate. All these people are here because they love you, and and um, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to say anything, but just sit down and be a ghost. So we had a like a reclining chair that kind of rocked a little bit, and I remember. Uh, that was my chair, and all I had to do was be a fly on the wall to be a ghost. Uh, and again, they they were imagining that I had just passed away, and it was my wake, and they're going to talk about the good and the bad about Andy Quinones. And so that was uh, one of the best interventions that I could have had in life because uh, from that, uh, I really got to have a full understanding of how my family sees me uh, in the sense where the good and the bad. Uh, you know, because my parents died when I was little and I knew about this, um, I guess I grew up with somewhat a chip on my shoulder. I felt sorry for myself that I didn't have what a lot of my other friends uh, that I grew up had. And that was an intact family, a mom that was my biological mother and our, our father was my biological father. So um, – I heard you guys talk about, again, the positive aspects of, and the qualities of, of who I am as a person, but also the things that are holding me back. And I remember as, a, as being that ghost, I, I really wanted to scream out and say, you know, defend myself, but I agreed not to say anything and I took it all in. And at one point I just remember just kind of breaking down because I wasn't holding my fist up, being defensive, but I allowed what you guys had to tell me. Uh, and, and it really... Um, uh, cracked the shell of my hard heart at the time and it allowed a little light in. And so I understood, I think from that point on that I can't go through the rest of my life, uh, feeling depressed or feeling sorry for myself. I have to take accountability and be, and accept what has happened to me in my life and use that to help me to be better, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Right. But not as a crutch, but as a, a stepping stone, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, as a matter of fact, I, I'm going to share an experience on it. Uh, I don't even have this written down, but I remember that after um, that whole intervention, you started writing down your goals because you yes. said, I never realized that people really thought the way they do about me. And so you started working with youth. Yes. And you re I remember you bringing this one kid to the house, um, and he would come to the house, and he was a troubled, teen, a troubled kid. And so you would bring him to the house. And so you were already starting to inspire young people at the time. And I remember another young kid that was from Pomona, and he ended up shooting a police officer and went to jail. And I remember you coming home, and you just had tears in your eyes and say, thinking you failed this kid. And I said, you can't save them all. Talk a little bit about your younger years and how you worked with these youth at that time. Yeah, well, uh, you know, again, uh, there's uh, – I'm going to bring up a guy named Herbert Romero, right? Uh, you, you, I'm sure you probably remember him. Uh, from way back then, but he was another mentor of mine that hung out with Danny and myself. And uh, one of the things that Herbert Romero uh, and Danny participated in was, I, I think it's called the unmasking. They would go into a uh, uh, an auditorium. Danny would be Danny, and then Romero, uh, he would be dressed as a full-on gangster. Uh, and Danny would interview him in front of these parents, and he would be like, you know, I'm going to recruit your, your children and I'm going to get them to the vario because, you know, he would go on and he'd get these parents mad. At the end of the uh, the session, he would take off the layers of the clothes and he'd have a business suit underneath, look real sharp. And and uh, that was the unmasking. And one of the things he said, he said, in the beginning of my life was a mess, but with age, my life turned into a message. So you got mess and age becomes message. Yeah. Right. So ah. the beginning of my life was somewhat of a mess. Uh, but with age, I was able to also turn it into a message. Uh, having the experience of maybe losing my, fam my, my parents at a young age and feeling a little bit lost and confused, uh, not sure if he was totally loved, um, having my issues with, uh, again, Rodrigo and I didn't get along perfectly when I was a young kid. I had a smart aleck mouth, and, and he probably had a little temper. Uh, and so... Um, in my junior high age to my 20s, again, getting involved in, in, in gangbanging and drugs and partying uh, to really lose myself. So at the age of 18, 19, when I got the DUI and I had a thousand hours community service, I spent some time in jail. And then Danny Oaxaca got me into the life of 
uh, doing gang intervention work. And so in my early 20s, working with a lot of young men that were gang involved, were on probation, that were experiencing the things that I felt that I had experienced as a teenager, uh, the confusion, uh, the anger, the frustration, uh, all these things. So I was able to take the mess that I had early in my life and work with, I mean, I probably work with thousands of kids from, from 21 to my current age. And um, I sometimes I feel like God prepared me, like that early part of my life was a preparation so that I can identify, that I can, I could feel what other people feel. Mm-hmm. Because again, as a, as a young man working with kids that were going through things, uh, I was very passionate about helping them transition uh, successfully into adulthood without one, either taking their own life or two, having their life taken through gangbanging or three, you know, ending up in jail for a long time. So uh, as, I've, as I've grown older, uh, of course, when we're going through the mess, it's very tough. And it was very tough for me at the time because I'm, 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 I'm an emotional person, I think. Um, but I understand that sometimes we need to experience things ourselves in order to help someone else later in life. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Pomona Promise Podcast Network. This is Andrew Quinones, your host, and we will be back with more. So stay tuned. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Andy's upbringing. You know, my husband, Rodrigo Mafla, he was orphaned at the age of, uh, he was two years old when his father took his life. And so when I met my husband, of course, I already had Andy. Andy was three years old. And my husband had always dreamed that he would be able to marry someone with a child because of what he went through. So sometimes you don't, you know, you do the best with what you have. And My husband is a straight arrow, so it's either left or right. You don't go in the middle. And so, of course, later in years, Rod and I had our own children, which is uh, uh, Laura and and Jason. And so Andy just felt that unloved connection, you know, like I do not love the way that, you know, you know, Rod loves his biological kids and probably me, too. But, uh, you know, we, we always loved Andy. We always wanted what was great for him. But Andy is a, many of you know, very right brain and, and got this leadership ability that's incredible. So when um, when Laura and, and Andy, uh, Laura and Jason were born, Laura has some questions. Okay. <laughs> so I have to ask her a question. She wants to know, what was your relationship with your siblings growing up and how has it changed? Well, I, I remember uh, growing up, again, for many years, uh, being a, uh, just the three of us and uh uh, I remember fantasizing about having a, uh, again, one of my imaginations, I said, maybe I have a, a brother out there or a sister, you know, where we, we were parted as young, you know, he, that one was adopted. And so I always wanted a brother or sister. And, and once, you know, my little sister, Laura, came into it, I was just, uh, I was just in love. You know, I, I was just, just so happy to, to have her to become a part of a family. And uh, my, you know, my, Laura, you're very special to me. My sister's very special to me. And, and I, I got to be a big brother. Um, and I, I was just again a wonderful addition to the family. Uh, somewhat, you know, I, I love, I still to this day love, love kids, you know, babies. And I thought it just, it, it added so much more to our, our, our little family. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and how wonderful. has it changed? Laura wants to know how that's changed. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, now, now again, Laura, she got married before I didn't have kids before I did. So, uh, being, I'm the oldest. So, uh, I think I went from being her inspiration to her being my inspiration, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, of course, even though there's seven years difference between us, I mean, it doesn't feel like much now that we're older. And, uh, I think we could, we both look at each other and, and have a mutual respect, uh, for each other. And, and I'm just so proud of her and I, I, I'm pretty sure she's very proud of me, but, um, it, I, I just, I feel, I feel somewhat bad for those people that only have one child, you know, and don't have the experience of, of having siblings, especially as they grow up. Uh, so um, thank you for having more, a <laughs> couple more kids. Yes. You are so welcome. 
Um, okay, let's talk about your lovely wife, Norma, who I just adore dearly. She's just a wonderful... That You guys both are wonderful parents to my grandkids, and I'm so grateful that I don't have to be involved in raising them because for some reason grandparents sometimes end up in that spot. Um, but let me ask you about my two adorable grandsons, uh-huh. okay, Andres and Asiel. What have they taught you? Well, Andres and Asiel, well... Now that I have, uh, again, two small children of my own, I got to tell you, it's uh, karma coming back to me. <laughs> it's it, my little boy, Andres, is is uh, like a spitting image of me, uh, mind, body, and spirit. So now I get to feel the things that my parents experienced uh, with me. Um, and also I get to be, I guess, the parent that I, I wanted as a kid. Um you know, again, my parents are great, but it just something was missing, I guess. Uh, so sometimes when I get upset or angry, I have to remember how would I want to have been treated as a as a child. So uh, I think also I think one of the most important things is I realize <laughs> I realize as an adult how much I can act like a big baby. Uh, not until having kids, I, I realize again that when I, I when I you know my, when the little the boys get tired or hungry, they get cranky and grouchy. But still to this day, I when I get tired or hungry, I get grouchy, and I can now see myself. Oh, I'm acting like I'm acting like my my kids. I'm acting just like them, you know. So <laughs> I feel like a big baby sometimes. Um, as an adult, I'm reminded of how I want how I want to treat them the way I wanted to be treated. But I, I think they really kind of matured me, uh, helped me to see things uh, differently, uh, more holistically. And um, I, I certainly hope I could do a good jo- you know, a fair job, you know, raising two, two boys to be good men. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So far what I've seen, Andy, so good. We're not perfect parents. We learn yeah. through a lot of those things. But um, tell me, this is another Laura question, what, what are some of your, your best memories as a child? Oh well, I got yeah, That's an easy one. Uh, I, I really enjoy family gatherings and growing up at at, at Casa Mafla. Uh, I want to I want to say growing up, we had parties at the house at least once a month, or if not our house, somebody's house. So in, in particular on, on dad's side. So and and he's the Colombian, and he had you know s- sisters and brothers, and so I I really enjoyed going to hanging out, whether it be birthday parties or holidays, hanging out with my cousins and. And and the, the the adults losing track of us because they're drinking and dancing all night long and having a good time and we could play video games or play tag or do whatever we wanted to do. So I really enjoyed the family gatherings growing up. Uh, either your uh, you know the Quinones side or the Mafla side, just being able to visit aunts and uncles and cousins and 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 hear music and eat food and and laugh and tell stories. Uh, those are, I think, you know, a lot of the best memories. Oh, that's, uh, that's awesome. And camping. Oh, yeah, camping also. <laughs> yes, we did annual camp trips. Um, okay, so let's talk about your community work because okay. I know that you, this, um, I think recently I saw where you had the boys, your two sons and Norma, and you guys were picking up trash. And I remember seeing a bunch of high school students picking up trash here in Pomona. And I was pretty touched by that. And I know that um, it takes effort to serve your community. Talk a little bit about your community work and why that's so important to you. Well, you know, I, I found a great joy through service in my life. Um, I think I could, again, get a little emotional. And uh, I've had experiences of depression throughout my life. And so it's hard to be depressed when you're in service to someone else. Uh, to it, the one, the one way to get out of my own head or somebody get out of their own head is by helping someone else. You know, you forget your own problems when you're helping someone else with theirs. So I've had the, the great fortune of, of making a career of a life of service in the nonprofit sector. And, um, you know, I, I get paid to, to help for the most part. Uh, again, it's been more than two decades since I've been in this field. And I still volunteer on a regular basis to, to, to good causes. And, and, and my job now is, is the CEO or the executive director of the Southern California Service Corps. I get to help recruit other people to get involved in, in, in service learning or civic engagement within the community. So uh, being a service to the community has brought me great joy in the sense where, one, uh, the stroking my ego 
Uh, I like to be told that you know I, I do a good <laughs> job, and, and so if you're I'm, if I'm constantly helping others, then I'm constantly receiving like positive feedback. So you know, and the ego can be tough to play with sometimes. So I like feeling good about the good work I'm doing. But um, when I'm really helpful to someone, and 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 when I receive you know that genuine gratitude, again, it touches my heart. Um, and and I just I don't know the the life of service has has brought me great joy. Uh, I, I don't worry about money. Uh, money is not my concern. Uh, physical, material objects are not my concern. Well, my concern is that by the time I die, you know, did I leave the world a better place than than I entered it? And so, with all the the history and the experience that I've had in my life, uh, they help to equip me to, I guess, to be a better servant uh, in my community. And and I, I like it. I like meeting people. And and one of the things I think a, a truth of life is that uh, life is about relationships. Um, and so being able to build relationships with other people within my life, in particular through the life of service, it, it's, it's, uh, it's meaningful and impactful. Right. right. It's not fluff. And you know what, Andy, to your listeners, because Andy and I had lunch today and we were talking about this, but uh, Gary Smalley, the five love languages, you know, if, if to the, your listeners who know Andy, if you really want to make points with Andy, it's recognition, you know, it's just, you know, just letting him know, I mean... What the, and I think he is doing a great job, and it's not just because he's my son, because I believe me, I know his flaws, but he's just got such great qualities. But I, I wanted to ask you, because you were artistic at a very young age, I know one of the reasons why you homeschool your son is because in school you used to go bonkers, oh, you, know, yeah. making, you know, because everything was academically driven, and so you chose to do that. So I want you to talk about that with homeschooling and why you chose that you know, path for, sure. for Andres. Well, one, it's um, again my my school memories are not the best in particular because, again, I was very hyperactive. Again, diagnosed with an ADHD at a young as a as a as a small child, uh, I had a hard time keeping my hands to myself, uh, keeping my comments to myself, and again back in those days, it was sit down, shut up, fold your hands, and pay attention. So I remember often getting call, you know, getting yeah. sent to the principal's office or or getting detention. Uh, be, because my impulse control wasn't very good at a, at a young age. Um, so in, in school is very different now. However, I still chose to homeschool uh, my boys. Uh, one, I'm, I feel very strongly about indoctrination. I, I didn't want my, 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 my boys to be indoctrinated by the government or the, the school system. Um, I want the first priorities in the life, their, their first priorities to be family. And, and community and connection. Uh, I've learned from other nations, uh, education that a, a kid doesn't need to sit down at five, six, seven, eight, nine years old for, for eight hours a day paying attention to a teacher in order to be intelligent. So uh, being able to homeschool, there's a flexibility of learning throughout the day. The first priorities I got from Japanese education and I want my boys to have manners, know how to to function appropriately within a social setting. Um, and again, the, the schooling that we have, I mean, I, I could teach them spelling all day long by looking at things and saying, what is that? How do you spell that? So at least my learning style is, is very interactive. Mm -hmm. uh, Norma's is, is a little bit more, again, uh, academic and, 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 and educational. Let's sit down and do this worksheet. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing right or wrong, but... You know, my, my little boy stays up, Andres in particular, stays up to past 10. He doesn't wake up to usually 8, 9 in the morning. I don't bother him about it. Uh, we, we get uh, his school done throughout the whole day. Often he'll come with me to an event so he gets to be around adults, know how to function in society, have manners uh, to practice. So, um, I, again, I certainly hope I'm doing right. But, again, maybe, mainly the two reasons is that I, I don't feel 100% great about the indoctrination of children in public education. And two, uh, I'm, I'm not too thrilled about the mandate of vaccines. Um, and, and, and being California, in order for a child to be a part of public education, they have to have all their vaccines. And that bothers me in the sense where, as a parent, uh, I feel that it's our responsibility uh, to the child 
as to raise them best as we can. And I think California government oversteps their their role by mandating that that parents do things to their child. And most parents that give their kids vaccine, I mean, they just trust the doctor. Right. You know, um, they're not educated themselves to know what does what. And I have a pretty good understanding of history. I love history. And there have been plenty of mistakes throughout history, in particular medical history, that 100 years from now, we may be looking back at this time and saying, what were you guys doing? I'm going to give you a couple points. At one point, they used to give x-rays to pregnant women. Uh, At another point, uh, this is the Roman Empire. You know, the pipes were full of lead and that ended up to the downfall of the Roman Empire because of the lead in the pipes. You know, having mercury in hats, uh, the Mad Hatter. uh, I mean, I I could name a dozen examples where the medical industry at that time when they thought they were doing it, I mean, they bloodletted it for hundreds of years, you know, uh, draining blood thinking that would be effective. So I don't particularly trust the medical, the, the medical industry where it's for profit, right? And in particular, and I, I, I know we probably got to get off the subject, but th- there was a law that was created, I want to say like 1983, that no longer are pharmaceuticals liable. If something goes wrong with my child or your child because of the vaccine or medication you gave them, you cannot sue the doctor, you cannot sue the, phar- the, the pharmaceutical company, you cannot sue the government, you're just, you're just stuck with it. So that, that raises flags to me that if somebody is not held accountable and they're responsible, why would I trust them, yes. if that makes sense? Yeah, you know, okay, I think you should do a whole podcast on vaccines. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> you're passionate about that. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, as kids growing up, and Andy's he's he's well traveled, and he much more travel obviously before he got married. You know, riding the elephants in Thailand, Machu Picchu, Germany. You know, all these different places that you've been. But I remember that we had um, international students that would come to our house and sit at our table, and we had international students from different parts of the world. And I think that you know you're you were very inquisitive so you would ask lots of questions and i think it gave you that inspiration to go out and travel so do you remember that we had a kid from gijon spain miguel yes and he was very formal came from a very well-to-do family as most of i think most of the the kids that stayed with us international students and um i remember he sat at the table and he was probably at the time 16 and they would drink wine with their dinner and i remember the him sitting down and saying um uh, where's my wine? And then Andy, who was younger, I think he were probably about 12, 13 at the time. And he, and you said, well, if Miguel's going to drink wine, I'm going to drink wine. Yeah. So we had to kind of educate him and say, you know, no, we don't drink wine. But what did you get from the, the, those experiences? Well, I got to tell you, uh, I think two things were very influential at a young age. And one, of course, was the foreign exchange students that would spend time with us. Uh, but two was the Natural Geographic magazine as well. And so I used to just just love using my imagination, um, it, imagining traveling and seeing the world. Uh, I didn't I didn't I wasn't satisfied with just looking at the picture and believing the story. I wanted my life also to be able to go to those places where I saw them in the magazines. So I think the foreign exchange student made that a little bit more real to me. Um, I, in seeing the magazines, reading the articles, looking at the pictures, but then having a kid from Germany or from Spain or from Indonesia. Um, having them come and, 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 and help me to realize that we live in a, on a, in a global society and, and we have the ability to pick up our, our backpacks or suitcases and travel to the other side of the world and make new friends. And I thought it was just fascinating. You know, and, uh, I really, uh, I, one of the, the, the great, I, I love traveling. I love meeting people. I love to talk to people that I've never met before, even when the language barrier and 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 feel a common ground. He gets uh, that from me. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh. <laughs> I can go into an empty room and, and make a lot of friends. Okay, I know I'm running out of time, but I have a final question for okay. you. And you know, because Andy's my masterpiece in the working, so you know, I want to know. And Laura asked this question too. What drove you to art? Because, and I know your biological father was very artistic. Mm. Okay, but she never met him. But tell me, what what drove you to art and well, one, again, I, you know, at the age of, again, as a teenager, I, I didn't know very much about my biological father, uh, Robert Orozco, uh, until I was 
near 40 years old, in my 40s, you know, Ancestry.com linked me to uh, my biological family, and it's been wonderful just learning more about uh, that part of my history, uh, the father part. And I learned, again, that I had artists within that side of the family, uh, some talented artists. And so I, I know within the Guinea side, I don't think we have any art talent as far as I know of, so I must have got it from my dad's side. But uh, I think in particular, uh, now this is a corny reason, but uh, I don't know, when I was 1995 or around that age, I remember the, the Titan, Titanic came out with Leonardo DiCaprio, and he was able to to draw the picture of the of the girl, <laughs> and, and I just remember, oh man, you know that's a skill that I want to learn, uh, in order to pick up girls, uh, in particular. So I remember taking a class at Mount Sac, the art class, and I was hoping to get you know uh, to develop a skill so that I would develop more pickup lines. So hey, let me <laughs> let me draw you. Maybe uh, you know take off your shirt. Let me see what I could you know. So the, one of the that was one of the reasons, but also you know I mean all throughout my life. Uh, I, I've al always doodled on paper in school. I'm, I was always drawing. Even as an adult, I'm always drawing in the corners of things. And uh, I think because of my ADHD, one of the things that helps me to focus, listen better to people, teachers, or, or people speaking is having my mind occupied uh, by, by drawing, but I could hear better. I could listen better rather than wanting to get so distracted but the other thing also, I think it just art is such a, a powerful tool, whether it be singing, uh, food, or, or, or um, fine arts. I just thought it was a skill that I really wanted to pick up uh, so that I could add value to my community. As you know, I've, I've done plenty of murals throughout the last 20 years, and I could go to a park or go somewhere in a community and think, you know, I, I contributed that with a group of kids to add value to my community. So... Um, I think as I've grown older as an artist, one, art helps me to meditate. It helps me to focus. It helps me to get my mind in a clear space by getting the energy in me out, out on into the material world. But the second thing, it's um, it allows me to give a gift to others that I may not ever meet. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Well, with that being said, I just want to say happy birthday to my Andy and um, this has just been a pleasure. I was looking so forward to being able to do this with Andy and he's got so many more qualities. His cooking, he's he's got this love of cooking that you know he shares with his dad and I. We love to, we both love being in the kitchen. But um, for all his listeners, I just think that uh, this is this podcast has been, you know, many of his podcasts. I think that the community itself, Pomona, what did you positive Pomona? Is that what you uh, yeah. Well, okay. So this is a. Uh, the Pomona's Promise Network podcast, where you get to learn more about uh, community stakeholders and leaders within the city of Pomona and the surrounding valley, about the good work that we're doing as individuals or as, as, as groups or as uh, organizations to add value to our community. But this studio right here, I called my studio Positive Pomona Productions because, uh, of course, I live and work and play here in Pomona. And, uh, you know, again, 20 years ago, Pomona had a... a a pretty awful name, you know, gangs, drugs, prostitution. So as an adult, been working in this community for more than 20 years to change the the the, the, the mood of this community in, in a sense. Uh, to to uh, and now having small children myself, I want to I want to live and and grow my family in a safe and healthy and a vibrant community. And so this is one way that I get to contribute uh, value to my community by by sharing the, the, the good news, uh, sharing the good stories uh, of other people that are also making a difference. Um, so again, you're at the Positive Pomona Production Studio in downtown Pomona, uh, where we get to interview community leaders and people making a difference. And uh, thank you for spending time with me on my birthday with my mom. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our, my little story and, and uh, my interview. And I hope that you continue to come back to watch more a podcast about the great people that we'll interview making a difference uh, within our lives and our region. Blessings to all. Blessings to all. <laughs> I hope you have a great day and peace. <laughs> all right. <laughs>